so let me uh, first introduce myself. So I work in the Center for Theoretical Physics, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, and maybe just a few words uh, about myself uh, and the group of people who with whom I work there. So uh, I did my PhD in physics in 2011 uh, uh, in, in the Center uh, for Theoretical Physics. Uh, then in uh, 2014, I did PhD in mathematics, and then I went for two years uh, as a Marie Curie fellow to MIT. And then uh, I returned for one more year to Bristol, and after this, uh, I came back to Poland, and I'm working in Warsaw. Uh, so my group uh, was uh, uh, quite big, like last year, but now it's shortened. And this is because uh, two PhD students uh, Katarzyna Karnas and Tomasz, uh, Tomasz Maciążek, so Kasia is sitting with us here. Uh, <coughs> they finished their PhDs uh, and moved on. So Tomek is now postdoc in Bristol, and Kasia, as I believe, is working in some business. Uh, so she is doing something practical. Uh, so after doing a PhD in mathematical physics, you can do something useful. Uh, good, and uh, so then. Uh, Kasia and Tomek, and Tomek were replaced by Lorenzo. He is sitting in the third row. And I also have one master student currently, uh, uh, Oskar Słowik. He started to collaborate with me when he was, uh, older, uh, he, when he was uh, BS, uh, bachelor student in Wrocław, but then I persuaded him to move to Warsaw, so he is now studying at the Warsaw University. Uh, okay, so this talk is supposed to be about uh, efficient quantum gates, but perhaps it's a good idea to start with classical gates and classical computers. <coughs> uh, so first I will say a few words about classical computers and classical gates, and then there will be like main two points of this talk. So first, uh, first point would be to explain what are actually universal gates and uh, how to characterize them, just very roughly. And then uh, <coughs> the second part will be devoted to uh, defining and speaking about something which I will call efficient universal quantum gate. Uh, okay, so uh, classical computers uses uh, classical computer uses Boolean logic, which means that operations are Boolean functions, uh, and they are performed on uh, input states which can be either zero or one. Those zeros and ones represent uh, false and truth. And uh, of course we know that every Boolean function can be realized using elementary blocks called logic gates. And the basic logic gates are for example AND, OR, NOT, XOR, NAND, etc. So uh, just to give you a simple example, so here we have a combinational circuit which represents one bit full other. So we want to add two numbers, so we should add them bit by bit. But of course it means also that can, there can be a bit of so-called carry in and carry out. So for example if I add two bits which are one, <coughs> one, one, so I add one plus one and then I have a carry in one, then the result is one, one. And now I can ask the question, how to build this kind of a function? So this is, this is the table of truth of this function. And then I should use some gates to build this. And this is uh, uh, one of the possible realizations of one bit full other, which works on a classical computer. So in general, every Boolean function has K inputs and N outputs. So K doesn't have to be equal to N. And a very well-known fact is that any Boolean function can be realized by combinational circuit that uses only NAND gates, which in other words means that NAND gate is a universal gate for classical computing. So now we want to uh, <coughs> extend this notion to quantum computing. And of course, in quantum computing, we don't have bits, but we have qubits. So we have a quantum system consisting 
in n, uh, consisting of n qubits. So we need n qubits just to take advantage, advantage of uh, phenomenon like entanglement. So we have uh, n qubits. And then any quantum gate is just a unitary matrix which operates on these qubits. So a matrix which fulfills those two conditions. So u dagger u is identity and vice uh, and the other way around also and the determinant is equal to one and this condition for the determinant to be equal one can be imposed because anyway global phase doesn't matter uh, okay and among all qubit gates uh, all uh, sorry among all quantum gates we can distinguish some subclasses of gates so the first important subclass is one qubit gate so these are gates which operate only on single qubits and also k qubit gates, so I take randomly or uh, as, as, I, as I want k qubits and I apply to them some unitary transformation. And this way, if I have a couple of gates, I can build new gates. Just here you have the example of something which is quantum circuit. So quantum circuit is just mathematically multiplication of some matrices. So I start with three qubits. And first I perform an operation on the qubit Q1, then a joint operation on qubits Q2 and Q3. So U2 is the two qubit gate. And then U3 is a two qubit gate, but applied to Q1 and Q2 and so on. And this way I can build a matrix U. And then <coughs> of course one should ask the question how to choose those building blocks uh, to be able to obtain any possible unitary operation and this is the question of uh, this is uh, this is the problem of universality so <coughs> but the problem of universality on the level of quantum gates is uh, much more complicated even to define than on the level of the classical gates and uh, soon it should be clear why so let me start with a set s it contains k gates quantum gates <coughs> and then we can treat elements of this set as a letters of some alphabet and then using those letters we can build words those words correspond to multiplications uh, between the elements which are given so by s n i will denote the set of all words of the length n and then i will say that the finite set S is universal or uh, more mathematically speaking it generates the whole group SUH if the set which consists of all, wor of all words of all possible lengths is dense in SUH. So this is, yes please. No, so these are just multiplications of matrices. <coughs> yeah, of course, uh, sometimes there might be some cancellations between those matrices. For example, I don't know if I have available matrix U in my set and its inverse, then the word U times U inverse is uh, just identity, so I don't need to count it. But we will not go to such details. <coughs> okay, uh, so this is a f uh, this is a, a, a good definition of uh, of universality. Uh, but now uh, we also need something uh, more uh, like to 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 enable uh, some calculations. So <coughs> density. Uh, to say that something is dense, one, uh, one, way, uh, one way to do it is to use a measure of distance. So on the group SUH, so on the group of the unitary matrices, we have a well-defined measure of distance. So the distance between two matrices U and V is just uh, given by this formula. This is a Hilbert-Schmidt distance. And then I can translate this uh, this previous definition to the following one, S is universal if for, if for every matrix in SUH and any epsilon there is n such that there exists a word of the length n which approximate u uh, with the precision epsilon and this epsilon can change 
it can be as small as I wish. So perhaps uh, one more comment. Why do we need actually this kind of a definition? Why, can we say why cannot we say simply that the set is universal if I can obtain all elements from the group SUH uh, by building those words? So there is a very basic reason why. So SUH is a continuous group. So it, it has a continuum number of elements. And by creating those words, <coughs> I can only get a countable set. So I cannot, with a countable set, uh, obtain all the elements from the set which, is, which has continuum number of elements. But I can uh, arbitrarily well approximate them, and this is the same story as for rational numbers and real numbers. So any real number can be approximated with arbitrary precision by some rational number. And one of those sets is countable, and the other one is uh, uh, of the, uh, it has continuum number of elements. So this is why we need this kind of a definition. So here I made, <coughs> actually I didn't uh, uh, make those pictures, Oscar ma made them. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a, like a pictorial uh, presentation of this definition. So uh, this uh, ball here represents my group. And I s uh, and those dots are gates. So red dots is, uh, are the gates which are given for me. And I want to approximate this black dot, which represents my desired unitary operation with the precision epsilon. So at the beginning, there are not enough dots, but I take longer words. There is more dots. And then finally, yes, I reach this region. And changing this epsilon to smaller and smaller, m uh, means that I will probably require longer and longer words to approach the, desire, uh, the, the, the unitary operation I want to realize. And yet another way of speaking about uh, universal gates, and uh, it's connected to the notion of epsilon nets. So <coughs> if I have any finite subset of SUH, or actually of any metric space, then <coughs> I call it epsilon net if for every element uh, there is an element in X such that it's epsilon close. Uh, so of course I can now phrase the universality using the language of <coughs> epsilon nets and I would say that S is universal if and, ev or if and only if for every epsilon there is such an N that Sn is epsilon net. Uh, good, so I will use later this notion of epsilon nets when I will be speaking about uh, solovay kitaya theorem. Okay, so we know now what, what is the precise meaning of the universal, uh, of the universal gate sets. <coughs> so now, what else do we know about them? So as I told you, we are working with qubits, so we have n qubit system, and now you can ask if there is there any general statement about the universality, and it turns out there is one. This is a quite old theorem, it was, uh, <coughs> it, uh, I think uh, it's something like more than 20 years uh, old, so, and it says that the universal set for n qubit quantum computing consists of all one qubit gates, so we need to be able to perform all the operations on single qubits. And then there is uh, <coughs> uh, an additional two qubit gate, just one is required. <coughs> and uh, this must be entangling gate, which means it does not map simple tensors onto simple tensors. Of course, typically we do not have access to all one qubit gates. We can just have access to some finite number of them. So you can make a refinement of this theorem using the previous definitions and say that S is universal, uh, that if I have a set which is universal for SU2, so a finite number of gates which generate SU2, then, uh, then this set plus additional entangling gate will be sorry, universal for SU2 to the power n. So it will be universal for uh, quantum computing with n qubits. Right. Uh, so, uh, what else do we know about uh, 
uh, universal gates. So, like, yes? Uh, if, uh, do we really need all the one qubit gates? Because it seems like one qubit gates are rotation, basically. And we know that by rotating, uh, for example, by one on a circle with uh, length two pi, we can generate all the. Uh, mm -hmm. something that is dense in. in space, yeah, yeah. Right? So this is exactly what I, I what I'm writing in this fact here. So if I have S which is universal for SU2, so it's enough to have two rotations, which uh, rotate, let's say, uh, by an angle which is not a rational multiple of pi. Uh, so this would be enough. So those two, and then the additional entangling. So all uh, one qubit gates is just a group SU2. So these are all unitary matrices two by two. <coughs> okay. Uh, so, oh, I did something. I don't, sorry. So now the obvious question one can ask is how likely it is that if I randomly choose some gates, they are universal. <coughs> and uh, paradoxically, this goes back to another theorem in mathematics, which uh, is from uh, 49. Uh, it's a theorem by Kuranishi. And it says that if I have a set of gates, so it doesn't have to be actually in SU2, in any SU group. So I I when I have a finite set, then uh <coughs> the universal sets of a given cardinality, so of the gi if, I, if I fix number of gates and I'm choosing them uh, randomly, they for the universal sets form a Zariski open set in SU2 to the, to the power k. So, of course, I need to explain you what is Zariski open. So this is actually a type of a topology which uh, is useful uh, in many branches of mathematics and actually in physics also, uh, especially in entanglement. So the set is Zariski closed if it is a zero locus of some polynomial equations. So this is a very simple definition. And then it is open if it is the complement of this set. <coughs> so this theorem implies that non-universal sets are characterized by zeros of some polynomial equations. So to be more precise, or just to clarify the whole idea, uh, look at the following example. So we take two matrices U1 and U2 from SU2. Uh, so one can write them always in this form. So we have four uh, parameters, alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2. Then there are two conditions such that those matrices have determinant 1. And then there should exist some polynomials P1 up to PR in the entries of those matrices, such that <coughs> whenever the set U1, U2 is non-universal, it satisfies those polynomials. And if it does not satisfy this set of equations, it is universal. So immediately from this, you find out that the probability that randomly chosen set is, non -univer is universal is actually equal to one. So it is highly unlikely <coughs> to randomly choose a set which is non-universal. Uh, great. Nevertheless, uh, of course, one uh, can ask the question, okay, but if someone is giving me some matrices, how, should I, uh, how can I check if they are universal or not? So this is uh, a question which uh, we asked uh, some time ago uh, with Kasia Karnas, and then uh, we actually provided some uh, algorithm which checks the universality of, uh, of, of any gates, not only for qubits, but also for qubits. So this is uh, uh, a procedure with finite number of steps, which allows you to decide if when someone is giving you a bunch of matrices, if they are universal or not. So if, uh, if you are interested how it works, I put here two references. Uh, explaining it. Uh, okay, so after giving some 
qualitative uh, properties of uh, uh, universal gates, let us move to uh, <coughs> more quantitative. So obviously, from the applicational point of view, it is always important how fast can I approximate my desired operation. So, <coughs> and this is what uh, uh, is contained in the statement of solovay kitayev theorem. So in this theorem, we assume that we, have a, uh, that we have a universal set, which is symmetric. So whenever I have some gate, I also have its inverse available. And then uh, this theorem roughly says that I can approximate any unitary matrix in SU2 uh, by the word, uh, I can epsilon approximate any uh, <coughs> unitary matrix in SU2 with the word whose length is uh, at most uh, of the order log to the power 3, 1 over epsilon. So if you just look at this theorem, it means, so uh, in those assumptions, you don't have anything about the specific set. It's true for any universal set, and it, also it, it means that all the universal sets are actually rather efficient. Uh, okay, good. So maybe let me only comment that this constant A in the formula, it actually depends on the set S. And also uh, this uh, exponent 3, uh, it need not to be like the perfectly optimal. This is not the, the most optimal theorem you can have. But uh, if you consider all uh, all sets, uh, this is uh, the only one which was proved in this generality. Uh, great. So let me give you now some uh, uh, main idea which stands behind the proof of this theorem, because uh, uh, it's actually not so difficult. Uh, so for this purpose, uh <coughs> I will need a bit of extra notation. So by BR, I denote a ball in the SU2 group, which is centered at identity and has radius R. Okay, and then U1, U2, with this uh, subscript G, this is a group commutator between U1 and U2. So it's U1, U2, U1 to minus 1, U2 to minus 1. And then <coughs> it is actually quite easy to prove the following thing. So if I have, uh, if words of the length L form an epsilon square net in a ball with the radius epsilon, so here we have a ball with the radius epsilon, this big one, and <coughs> the words of the length L form the epsilon square net, which means that yeah, they cover this ball nicely. Uh, so then, if I take the commutators of those elements, uh, I will go to the ball which has radius epsilon square, and those commutators will give me the covering of this ball uh, which has the radius uh, epsilon to the power 3. <coughs> so I can transform epsilon square net from B epsilon to the epsilon to the power 3 net in B epsilon square. So this is like the crucial uh, <coughs> uh, observation which is used in the solovay kitayev theorem. And now I will show you <coughs> briefly how to use it exact, uh, actually. So what we want to do, uh, 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 so we start with some finite set of gates. Great, and we want to find an epsilon approximation to some element u in SU2. Uh, I know it doesn't look friendly, there are too many formulas, but you have to read them one by one and then it's clear. <laughs> uh, good. So we know that S is universal, so <coughs> we can always choose some element u0, so some word of the length L0, which epsilon zero approximates, epsilon square zero appro approximate my desired matrix U. So this is the desired matrix and this is the starting word. This epsilon zero square is typically far from epsilon. And now what I do is I calculate the error uh, 
of this, uh, of this approximation, so I multiply u by u0 to minus 1. And then when you do the calculation, it turns out that this error is actually epsilon square, epsilon 0 square far from identity. What does it mean? It means that I can now use this lemma, <coughs> take the commutators of those words of the length L0, and uh, find an approximation of delta, which is of the order epsilon to the power 3. So if I do this, uh, so yeah, here we have it, so this is delta 1, and now I approximate it with u1, which is, the <coughs> which is an element uh, of the set of words of the length for L0. So I've got it, and now I want to know what is the distance between u and the sequence u0 times u1. So once again, using some invariance of this, uh, uh, of this norm, now I find out that this is of the order epsilon 0 to the power 3. So I improved it greatly. So first, it was, uh, first, tr uh, first approximation was of the order epsilon 0 square, and the second one is of the order epsilon 0 to the power 3. And now I can repeat this, correct? Uh, now uh, <coughs> by delta 2 I <coughs> mean the error of this new approximation, so of this word. I can calculate the distance of this arrow from the identity, blah, blah, blah. And this way, <coughs> every time uh, when I'm doing this procedure, I'm uh, taking bigger and bigger powers of epsilon zero. So you can, as you can see, by taking commutators, uh, the epsilon is going up exponentially. So that's why if you really now start counting those things uh, and you do the proper mathematics, you should not be surprised that in this formula you have logarithm. And of course, this power 3 is uh, something you have to calculate. Uh, okay, so are there any questions here? Excuse me? Uh, what is A? Ah, how A is... Yeah, yeah, so this will be... Uh, other part of the talk. Uh, so now, so, so look, because I, I, I need to do commutators, and commutator is defined by u1, u2, u so if I don't have uh, inverses, I cannot perform commutators, and I cannot do all this procedure. So actually there exists uh, <coughs> a statement of this theorem, which is, uh, uh, for non-symmetric states, but there is no algorithm which realizes uh, this, uh, this theorem. Because uh, the, the proof I was showing you is actually constructive. It tells you what you need to do to epsilon approximate. You just need to move basically with commutators. So this is actually funny because this is the same idea when you are like parking, parallel parking your car you are also moving with commutators. So parking a car and doing quantum computing is the same. <laughs> Roughly the same. Okay. Yes, so this Yes, so this norm was defined at the very beginning. So this is Hilbert Schmidt norm. But uh, I only require from this norm to be uh, uh, invariant with respect to the unitary reaction. So uh, you can use any other norm which has this, this property. And then, of course, you need to rescale everything. <coughs> OK, great. Uh, so now, uh, so what, uh, let me summarize, maybe, because I am now moving to the second part of this talk. So I told you what does it mean that the set is, is universal. And I uh, also gave you some uh, uh, some uh, qualitative properties of uh, universal sets. And then uh, <coughs> we had this <coughs> very important theorem, which actually uh, stands behind all quantum computing, which is done nowadays, the solovay kitaya theorem, uh, which says that, uh, roughly speaking, all universal, gate, uh, all universal sets are 
uh, rather efficient. Yeah, but of course, devil is in details. Uh, and so we know this. So now uh, uh, I'm coming back to your question uh, about how A changes with S. So how this constant in, the, uh, in this formula depends on the set S. Uh, and if by changing sets S to some different sets, we can improve it. And about the question if this power of three here is actually important. So you may think that actually these questions are not reasonable. Why should one care about it? Uh, <coughs> if we have a power of three or we don't have a power of three. Uh, like this is the same uh, complexity class or whatsoever. But nowadays the devices, quantum devices which, uh, which we have, uh, they are noisy. There is a lot of decoherence. So uh, the target is to construct as short as possible uh, a quantum circuit which uh, realizes the task we want it to realize. So it's actually very important if we are doing something with 100 gates or million gates because it changes story completely. At least uh, for, the, the for the devices which are now available, if you have a perfect quantum computer, it doesn't matter. No one would matter if uh, uh, about this. No one would care about this three if there is no decoherence and noise. Uh, but the, rea the reality is different, so we have to care about it. Uh, great. So let me start with this exponent. Uh, is it actually the optimal value? This three here. So to see that it is actually not. It's enough to consider a very simple uh, thought experiment, I would say. So, <coughs> uh, yes, so in the group SU2, we can have balls. And by VB epsilon, I will denote a volume of a ball which is centered at identity and has radius epsilon. So, of course, to calculate volume, you need to have some measure of volume, but it's all well defined for compact groups. This is so called Haar measure, and then the distance, we already know what is distance. This is this Hilbert Schmidt norm. So now, SU2 is a three dimensional group. So the volume of a ball in three dimensions, if we were in the space R3, would be 4 pi over 3 times R to the power of 3. Yes? So the only difference here is that, uh, of course, it will be some epsilon to the power of three, but there will be some consts. So I can always bound the volume of a ball of radius epsilon from, uh, from the <coughs> above and uh, from uh, uh, here by some uh, uh, consts which multiply epsilon to the power of three. So this is uh, uh, something you should uh, uh, agree with me. And what is the best possible case of a universal set? So this is such a set that if I look at all the elements it generate, then this group, uh, the, 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 there are no relations between those elements. So I'm always, when I'm doing the multiplication, I generate something new. And also, uh, those elements is, are uniformly distributed over the whole group. So this is the best possible case. So in the best possible case, the words of the length n, how many of them I have. So I can choose the first uh, gate <coughs> this many times, so as, uh, as the ca cardinality of the set of the given gates. And the second element, I can choose on the module s minus one ways, because I should not use u to minus one. If I chosen as the first gate u1, let's say, then the second gate should not be u1 to minus one because then I am not creating anything new. And when you apply this rule n minus one times, so then you are getting the cardinality of the set of, le of, of all words of length n. And now if you take all those words and you multiply them by the volume of the ball, you should be able to cover the entire group and the volume of the whole group is one because I use the normalized measure. So now you take this formula and you do the like algebraic manipulations and you find out that n 
which gives you this uh, nice covering is given by some const time log one over epsilon and plus something. So the ex the, this exponent, which in the Solovay-Kitaev theorem th uh, is three, uh, can be, uh, there is a chance that it, it can be one actually. So this is uh, one improvement uh, which uh, perhaps can be done. And now uh, we are coming back to the question about A. So of course I, I also have some formula for A here. So it just depends on the, on the cardinality of S, but this is like the, the best possible case and uh, we don't know if this case is actually possible, uh, uh, if we can actually achieve this case. So we need to study more uh, <coughs> the, 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 this, the, the things connected to this constant A. And uh, this can be done uh, by, uh, by usage of the so-called averaging operators. So look, <coughs> we want to quant uh, quantify some things connected to the efficiency of gates. We know that it's all about the length of the sequences which give uh, desired approximations and so on, but this, this notion lacks tools. Uh, using uh, this kind of notion, you cannot say anything or calculate anything. Uh <coughs> So you need to transform this problem into a different level where you have some tools for calculations. And the idea is to use uh, averaging operators. So <coughs> we are now dealing with qubits. So I have a group SU2. So on SU2, I can have functions. And now I can average them. So averaging function on SU2 is just calculating the integral of this function over the whole group. And I know <coughs> this, is, uh, this is done with respect to the Haar measure. Uh, and now I have a set of gates. I know it is universal. So now I can define an operator which uses those gates. So it gives me the average, but this average is calculated as a finite sum over the gates which are available. So if I want to uh, calculate the value of the function in point H, so H is some element from SU2, I calculate it, <coughs> I shift this H with all the elements from my universal set, <coughs> and I calculate this average. So why is it so uh, clever to do, this, uh, to this, to do the, this kind of things? Because if you look at the powers of this operator, then uh, you will see that powers of Ts, they average over the words of the length n. So if I take the nth power, I'm averaging over the words of the length n. <coughs> and I know that the set is universal, so length, uh, words of the length n, when n goes to, goes to infinity, they start to cover my group. So uh, you can, uh, uh, so you, you should have the convergence, so this operator Tns when n goes to infinity, should converge to this nicely defined operator which averages with respect to the Haar measure. And we want to use this idea to quantify the efficiency. And uh, first, to do it, uh, we need to have closer look at the operator Ts itself. Uh, so if I want to speak about the convergence of this sequence, uh, the good way to do it is to use some metric, some distance, yes? When I, I, I want to know when those operators TNS converge to the operator TSU2, and there is a standard metric, which is the uh, norm, uh, operator norm, which we calculate in this way. Uh, and Okay, so this you have to take for granted because I don't want to uh, bother you with too many details. Operator TS is bounded, self-adjoint. Uh, this actually everyone can uh, verify so that the constant function is the eigenfunction of this operator because this is the averaging operator. So averaging a constant function gives me the same constant function. It has a norm one and it means that its spectrum is between minus one and one. <coughs> okay. 
So now the trick is to take this operator and restrict it to functions which are perpendicular to the constant function. Uh, so these are uh, the function with vanishing mean. So uh, if I average them uh, over the entire group, I get zero. And then the norm of the restricted operator uh, might not be one. It can be strictly smaller than one. And then the difference between this norm and one is what we call the spectral gap of this operator. So here have you have the picture which represents the spectrum of this operator, actually the module of the spectrum <coughs> of this restricted operator. So it's somewhere between zero and one. Uh, <coughs> then lambda one is this norm. Yes, so the whole spectrum is here and this region is empty and that's why we call it gap. Uh, okay, great. So why actually I'm speaking about this gap? Uh, it's because of this very simple calculation which I want to show you. So we want to study the convergence of the sequence uh, of operators which comes from my universal set and the averaging oper operator with respect to the Haar measure. So this difference, because those two operators commute, I can change it <coughs> to this and then operators are Hermitian which means that I can take n outside of the norm. <coughs> but if you look at closer at, th at this difference, this is actually this restricted operator. And this restricted operator, its norm is one minus gap. So the speed of the convergence of the sequence of this operator is actually determined by gap. It's e to minus n gap s. So uh, we want to know more about this gap. Yes, because this, uh, the gap of the averaging operator associated with some universal set uh, contains information about how quickly we can approximate. Uh, so just to show you that uh, this is uh, something people really study, uh, uh, there was not so much of, uh, information about the spectral gap of averaging operators even for SU2. Only in 2011, actually, there was first result which says that uh, if I have a universal set of matrices, uh, uh, if I have a universal set and the matrices which uh, uh, are in this set have algebraic entries, so the entries are uh, solutions of some polynomials, then the gap actually exists. So the existence of gap was the open problem for a very long time. And so this theorem was proved by Bourgain and Gambour, and one of them is a Fields medalist. So uh, just to indicate that these are quite difficult and important problems. Uh, so what else do we know about gap, about the spectral gap? So there is a quite old result by Keston, which comes from uh, some random walks on groups. And it says that gap uh, cannot be too big actually. So it's always bounded by something from above. <coughs> and it's bounded by, uh, by, by this expression. So if I have a set which has from the beginning a lot of gates, then there is a possibility that this gap will be big. And this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, something one would expect. And <coughs> there is also this conjecture by, by Peter Sarnak, uh, which says that actually for every universal set, we have a spectral gap. Okay, so we have, uh, I, I summarized some information about gap. So we know that gap is crucial for the convergence of this sequence of operators, but now how it actually translates to the length of the sequence which approximate our, our desired unitary uh, operation. And this is another theorem uh, which says that when I have a universal set and I know that this set has a gap, then I can approximate any unitary operation with log one over epsilon gates. So I don't need this factor, th uh, this exponent three. And I have a precise formula for A, which depends on gap. Yes, so if gap is very close to one, so if the gap is big, then this 
uh, expression here, log one over one, uh, yeah, okay, this expression, so what happens to it? Uh, it becomes really big. So if gap is big, the denominator here is big and the constant a is small. And this is what we want. And if gap is very small, this is roughly one. One by one is one, so log one <coughs> is zero. So uh, three over zero gives me something extremely big. So I, so, <coughs> so the basic uh, uh, conclusion from this is that we want to have gates that have big spectral gap. Uh, so we want to know uh, how to construct them. Uh, and also, to some extent, we would also like to know how this gap changes if I randomly choose uh, 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 some universal sets. Because I know that if I randomly choose uh, unitary gates, they will be universal with probability one. And then I can ask the question, what happens with the gap? So there is a partial answer to those main challenges I, I, uh, I wrote here. And this is uh, some old paper uh, by those mathematicians, Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak, where they uh, actually they were not considering gates, of course, because no one in 84 was interested in quantum gates. <coughs> they were just considering some random walks on, uh, on spheres. And uh, they show that using some techniques connected to quaternion algebras, <coughs> one can construct SU2 gates with the optimal spectral gap. So the, the gap which is given by this upper bound of Keston. Uh, but it's only, uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, but if it changes uh, uh, 10 to the power 8 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the, it yes, and exactly. We also want to know how this gap changes if we randomly do something with the set, so change one gate from the set to something different, uh, how, uh, <coughs> how sensitive it is. <coughs> and these are the questions uh, which are completely open. It's like almost nothing is known about it. Uh, so this, uh, this result which I was speaking about just a while ago <coughs> is also quite peculiar because it only works when the number of your gates plus one is the prime number, which is one uh, <coughs> modulo four. <laughs> so, uh, and, of and then, of course, there is the whole construction which works for this setting. Uh, okay, so maybe just to uh, give you some examples, because perhaps after this talk you might have an impression that uh, uh, we don't know any example of uh, efficient quantum gates, and this is not true. Uh, so I am giving you two examples of efficient quantum gates for qubits. So the first one is the one which was uh, constructed by uh, Lubotsky, P uh, Phillips, and Sarnak. So these are the so-called V gates. But the second example is something you can find in every book to quantum computing. It's the gate H, Hadamard gate, and the phase gate T. And only like recently, people realized that those gates everyone was using, that they are actually uh, efficient gates. So they have the optimal spectral gap and they give you the <coughs> optimal uh, s length of the sequence for approximation. Okay. So this Mm -hmm. uh, but in S, I if I have, for example, 10 qubits, then those uh, does not have to be optimal. Yeah, so this is the question how to now extend, because I know that, for example, if I extend it with the C naught gate, yes, this two qubit gate, I will get something universal. But adding, uh, one can ask the question if adding actually C naught gate uh, 
still uh, gives me this efficient universality on the level of, uh, I know, four qubits or two qubits or whatsoever. Yes, so uh, this is something I don't know, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is actually everything I wanted to tell you about uh, uh, universal gates and efficient gates in terms of uh, science. I also want to uh, advertise something. So we will have some open positions in the Center for Theoretical Physics. So recently we got <coughs> a quite prestigious grant from uh, Foundation for Polish Science. Uh, so we will have uh, a position for one postdoc, for two PhD students, for one master student. Uh, am I correct, Miho? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so because this is, uh, these positions are in the, in the team which will be led by Michał Wyszmaniec. Michał is sitting uh, uh, over there. Uh, so we have also some other grant applications which uh, <coughs> some of them will be, so we will have results uh, like in a week or maybe two weeks at most. And then the others in the, <coughs> in the autumn, so there are some more positions. And we always welcome uh, students for summer internships. <coughs> this is mostly for, I would say, advanced BSc students or master students. And if you are interested in anything uh, I was speaking about or in things which uh, Michał Oszmaniec was speaking uh, one month ago, then uh, you can just email us and we can meet and speak. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions to Michal? Okay, so I have one question, if possible. Okay, yeah. Because you, you said that the theory which you uh, presented today is just a base for uh, all quantum computers and quantum gates that are built nowadays. Is that true? Uh, d did I understand correctly, right? Uh, that uh, once again that, that the theory which you present that is just the base uh, of all quantum gates and quantum computers that are built nowadays. Uh, right? So, in all the cases where you have uh, this idea of universality, that you start with finite number of okay. gates and then you are building something from this. So, for all architectures where you have quantum circuits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in in case of all universal quantum computers that are built nowadays quantum gates are just based on this theory more or less right yeah okay <coughs> but it's not true in case of uh, quantum annealers for example yeah right? this is a different story okay um, so uh, assuming that someone uh, want to just learn more about uh, uh, what you presented I understand that people can contact you of course uh, yeah. but are there any maybe uh, material some videos or books which you can recommend uh. So I can think about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, yep. let me think about it. So if someone contacts me, I can send some links to, to things which are perhaps, uh, uh, yeah, like. Okay, and the of, of course we, we can later also publish uh, materials on our uh, Facebook group. Uh, all right, yeah, now two questions. Is this uh, method generalizable for QDITs? Uh, yes. So uh, actually, I intentionally was writing everything with qubits because uh, <coughs> typically people do not like qubits. <laughs> so, but uh, all the theorems which uh, were here, they are also true for qubits. Of course, you have to adjust them a bit. For example, I don't know if you have a solovay kitayev theorem for qubits, then here you don't have the power of three but something uh, different, which depends on the dimension of the group. So it depends on D. And the group will be the same as SUD. SUD. Yes. So this, this group uh, SU2 is very important uh, in physics, since elementary particle theory is very important. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also SU3 is, I think, in elementary particles quite important or not. <laughs> Exactly, because, <laughs> exactly. 
Yes, yeah, so when he was probably writing the, this paper. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he is from the number theory. <coughs> and uh, so you can see that uh, I wrote here using quaternion algebras, etc. So this is close to number theory, I would say. Yes, and there is a prime number here even. <laughs> All right, any more questions, David? You mentioned that if we have a perfect quantum computer without noise, then we don't care about the... Um, about all I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, about the uh, free in the logarithm, but uh, yeah. I think it's not exactly true, because even if you have perfect quantum computer, then we want to reduce the complexity as much as we can. <coughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, so I was just saying it in terms of. Uh, uh, so look, if you uh, if you want to put some uh, something into a class of complexity, so will you distinguish between an algorithm which runs in the linear time and which runs in the uh, let's say polynomial of the degree one hundred and seven? So I would not distinguish between them. I would say that the I would say that the complexity is polynomial. So if you <laughs> if you uh, just uh, make some, uh, it depends on how uh, how how fine are your boxes to distinguish between. Yes. So uh, of course, to some extent, you are right. If you want to be really precise, then still log to the power three is not so good as log to the power one. Yeah, but from the like it will it it can be all called polylock. <laughs> okay, any more questions? No? Okay, so let's thank once again Adam. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, I said that it was the sixth meeting of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, the next meeting, or in fact two e next events, will be in May. But the next event it will be a bit different because this time uh, it will be a workshop. Uh, we are organizing a workshop aiming to uh, teach people how to program quantum computers using Qiskit. It's a uh, quantum computing framework from um, IBM and uh, we are going to organize this workshop at the Faculty of Physics of the University of Warsaw. So of course uh, there will be uh, separate announcements uh, on our Facebook group and on our mailing list so please follow our group and, uh, and our list and uh, yeah there will be more, more info within a few, uh, few weeks and just one day after on 27th of May uh, we'll meet again here and uh, the topic will be more or less the same or very similar uh, but this time it will be a bit more advanced lecture uh, given by Tomasz Stopa from IBM from Kraków uh, so he will come to us to uh, tell about programming quantum computers so just just before uh, yeah b before before that lecture there will be a workshop when you can uh, just try it by yourself uh, how uh, to program uh, quantum computers using this framework and later Tomasz will tell you about a bit more advanced uh, stuff. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, this event was organized uh, uh, by Warsaw Quantum Computing Group but also supported by, by Daft Code, similar as the next, uh, uh, next event in May. Um, if you uh, would like to, to follow uh, announcements from our group uh, we have our Facebook group, we have mailing list, we have a uh, YouTube channel which you can also follow and re quite recently we uh, created a Facebook fan page so we are also going to uh, publish some materials, some learning stuff for example introduction to uh, quantum computing and programming quantum computers and I know that also Kasia wanted to say something about such, such materials which we are also going to publish on our fan page. Good evening, my name is Katarzyna Kowalczyk-Murynka and some of you probably know that there is um, 
series of video tutorials uh, recorded um, and available available on YouTube. And I am the one responsible for, for this. I, I am the one who records um, the videos and um, especially the, the, the last one which is available is quite um, complementary to what Adam uh, said because it's about uh, quantum gates but on a quite um, basic level. <coughs> but what I wanted to say um, to you is that we are close to the end of this uh, series of, of tutorials. Um, we are about to publish uh, three, three videos which uh, are about uh, the Grover algorithm and then probably um, we will uh, we will finish the, the 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 series, but I am the one to uh, to contact if if you want to have some ideas or or questions or maybe um, you you would want to 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 you would want us to create create some very basic uh, tutorial about some material on on physics or <coughs> whatever um, complements the the the. the um, a bit nervous. Uh, whatever complements the the uh, the yes, thank you. Mm, then please contact me. I repeat, my name is Katarzyna Kowalczyk Murenka. I am. I've just joined the the Facebook group, so so uh, I am available all, 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 uh, also uh, there. Uh, so please don't hesitate to 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 contact and and that is it. That is. Great, great, thanks. So I, I also recommend you contacting Kasia, of course. Um, I think that's that's all for today. So we have meetings planned for May, and uh, um, yeah, there will be probably one. So one more announcement, yes. Yeah, the idea is to to test or or to extend this this. Uh, project of really uh, learning so something if you if you want us to prepare some different material or if you want to there are two things if you want to discuss something you are very welcome at aleja lotników 32 slash 46 when you can talk with adam and all other people and soon also with with michal and so never hesitate to to come except that you have to make an arrangement between because we have only two hours in a week when everybody is obliged to be in the institute so coming at random <laughs> coming at random is not the best strategy it's not an efficient strategy i would say uh, and so so another thing is that we uh, have a lot of experience with uh, recording such a short video courses. So if you want to hear about something or to deepen something or whatever, probably basic, basically in the scope of this meeting, right? Uh, we would be very happy to, 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 to record something about black holes, but maybe we have to organize another group for that, okay? Uh, so quantum computing, quantum information processing and things like that, we will do it because uh, we consider it fun and our obligation as well. But we need an input, what else? There are three videos uh, missing from this course. After that, maybe we will produce one more with problems to solve by yourself, just with somebody. And then the question is, what next? And with that question, contact Kasia. Answer to this question, contact Kasia. Okay. Thank you. Uh, David? I think the material is great. I watched it uh, recently, but um, I, it's not patriotic. Uh, but I will also make it in English to go to the, I would say, more white audience, because as I previously mentioned, um, the material is so good that um, it's just a pity that you don't reach some English speakers. of this sort available in English and almost none in Polish. And b b basically, if you have a student 
at the third, fourth year, and he or she has not, actually in English now there is a new gender solution. If you don't want whether you say he or she, you say uh, uh, multiple, you say they. And they don't, does not know, this is correct. And they does not know uh, uh, English sufficiently well, uh, they will never be able to learn this material and decide that they want to go for it, right? If this is not in Polish. And this is our main, main um, objection, so to speak. Also, I mean, realistically, we don't want to compete with people in Harvard. Maybe we are not less clever, but they are more, more better known, so to speak, right? So people have tendency to trust their materials better. What we can do, if we get some money from the next grant, that's a good idea. We can translate subtitles to English, for example. But dubbing it into English or forcing Kasia to uh, re-record it to English, does it really make sense? That's a good question. I would like to... <laughs> because putting subtitles in English, that's something we can do. We are apl actually apply for some international recognition grant for Polish funding agency. And that's a very good idea. We can add some money in the plan for putting subtitles to those videos. OK. Great, so <laughs> very, very good idea emerged. So I'm, I'm also very happy. And maybe one, one more thing, we are also uh, looking for speakers. So we have some plans for for uh, so of course we have a speaker for May. We have some plans for a speaker in June and also even in October. Uh, but if any one of you is interested in giving a talk here um, within the next few months, then uh, please let me know and uh, uh, we can organize it, of course. Um, all right. So thank you once again for for coming for your time and uh, hope to see you next time in May. Have a nice uh, long weekend. <laughs> bye bye.